Bien, eh, buenas tardes. Ok, good evening everyone and welcome to uh, Fundación Telefónica. I see many friends in the audience, but I'm sure that there are many of people that don't know me. I'm Jose Maria Sanz Payón, the general manager of Fundación Telefónica. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this marvelous and amazing presentation of this new stage of a Telus magazine, a magazine that, as uh, some of you already know, because some people have been uh, the protagonists of it, was launched 32 years ago in 1985 with the goal of researching about technology, communication and society. We've been together for, for 32 years during which the magazine has been the state of the art of technology and the analysis, seeing how the technological change has affected society. If Stendhal said that novel had to be a mirror during our way, this magazine has been a mirror during the uh, technological journey that has country has gone through and our society too from the first uh, issue in 1985 that was about a teletext until the uh, appear the, the 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 emergence of in the internet the video in during the 80s the internet and uh, convergence during the 90s the explosion of a uh, world wide web uh, the uh, society of uh, knowledge and digital economy during the years 2000 all these phenomena have been uh, anticipated and reflected by Telus magazine by our dearest Telus magazine Chesterton used to say that he liked old-fashioned ideas because only these old-fashioned ideas, only good ideas, survive and can become old-fashioned ide ideas. With this, I don't mean that, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that Telus is an old-fashioned magazine, but it's a very good idea and an old-fashioned idea, 32 years old. And because of this, I thought that it was very important to uh, renew it because the world has changed dramatically since then. The society has changed and we think that it is important that the magazine that accompanies these changes has a renewal process. Among other things, because uh, around 1982, when this small group of uh, visionaries, uh, Fundesco then, started working on these topics, uh, we were talking about some kind of dark topics, and I guess that they were not very interesting for many people. Uh, there were people at um, people from, from the universities, the academia, deans, etc., but they were not conscious about how impactful these ideas would be in society, and it was just for, for the academia world, so to speak. So now we have all realized that the impact of the technological revolution that has been brutal has been much bigger than any other technological revolution ever, is affecting almost all aspects of our lives, and this is why it has become a much more eye-catching issue and uh, we think that it's important that without losing the perspective of that scientific spirit that Talos has always had to become a more accessible uh, magazine because of its uh, structure, it its contents and we hope that it can become uh, the first stage to reach new audiences. Our goal with this new TELUS is to implement it much deeper in LATAM. We think that we have the chance, the challenge and the ambition of uh, making TELUS the re the reference magazine of the digital world in Spanish and maybe in Portuguese language too in, during our next stage. So we think that this is a great chance for which we will work. and. Uh, we have, uh, there have, many other people have joined us in our research, uh, scientific committee with this uh, aim to make it become a much more hemispherical and global magazine. The other change that was almost compulsory was to provide it with online content that could be updated much more frequently up to now uh, Telus uh, online Telus was online uh, was uh, the the PDF files of the magazine and we think that this is from the 80s from the 90s now we need to have much more interactive uh, and dynamic contents that are constantly updated that are refreshed so that people can give an opinion we are able to collect opinions to have discussions so that
This is another of the greatest innovations that we are going to introduce, this uh, website, uh, this online presence. But the challenge is to innovate, but also to make it last. A short after, a short before coming down, uh, I've looked for an old issue, and I found number four that was published in 1985. It's a, a, a piece of museum, so to speak. I must be really thankful to Sylvia because she has brought it along. But when we have a look at this issue, we see perfectly how they were dealing with the the current topics. Then we can see a section of uh, Enrique Tierno Galvan, where he points out to that uh, lack of confidence towards technology. The title was to look for how technology develops, but we see that uh, in the central pages, central pages were about IT and education, and the role that IT had to have, and technolo new technology had to have in schools, and this was 32 years ago. Now we see that discussion is uh, ongoing, we have progressed, but we see that in TELUS they were pointing out to many of the neuralgic topics that this social change was going to mean. So I hope that current uh, TELUS team, managed by Juan Zafra, congratulations Juan, I hope that they still have this same um, aim when facing new discussions and in 30 years time when someone picks, picks uh, this, uh, this issue can see that the topics that we are dealing with are the, the current topics sometimes because we haven't come over them and in other cases because we have progress but it is where we had to put that um, that highlight so last but not least Acknowledgements. Uh, 32 years are well, many years, and I think that this event must have two approaches. On the ones, on the one hand, a new launch of this new Telus, but a tribute to the Telus that during 32 years has been a mirror on our way in terms of anticipating and telling the technological change. Uh, with these acknowledgments, well, uh, we have some protagonists, for, exam for example, Abdulio Martin, I have to mention you absolutely, Enrique Bustamante, uh, Bustamante the, who has been the manager for many years, some people that are not among us, but that have uh, been really great and have been important for uh, mm, tell us success, success that like Roberto Velázquez or Manu Cebrián. And I have to mention uh, uh, Luis Solana, who was a uh, CEO of uh, Telefonica. He's not among us, but during his uh, during his uh, the, 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 while he was uh, holding that position. Uh, we progress a lot, so I think that th that perspective uh, of uh, making things live after 32 years and the fact of refurbishing it, so to speak, so that it can keep on walking, I think that the view is really worth it. Of course, we would like to thank the whole uh, team from Fundación Telefónica who have uh, worked for all these years and that have put a great bunch of effort in this uh, refurbishment or re renewal, uh, Rosa Maria, Mudena, Pablo, Eva, uh, the communication team who have worked in a team. And there, are no de there are departments here. Everybody has put their effort to come to this point and to the scientific committee, the, all the collaborators, and without any kind of doubt to Juan Zafra and his team. They have done a great job, uh, designers, etc. And uh, with these acknowledgements, I would like to give the floor to the protagonist of the new TELUS, Amber Case, a cyber anthropologist, as she herself defined herself. I've, luckily, I've met her uh, a short ago. She says that she lives stick to a screen. She's a cyborg. I, I guess that she will tell us now. But it's fantastic because we can think that people uh, in this digital world live at a, a great speed. They are stressed. And in the case of Amber Case, it's just the opposite. She's uh, she mm, is exudating um, calmness and to put technology to the service of the people. And this is how we are convinced that it must be. As Amber says, technology is human. And it is what makes us human too. So thank you very much you all for being here today. And I give the floor to 
Amber Case, thank you. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. Could I have all of you hold up your phones really fast? Just hold up, hold up your phones really quickly here. Great. Oh, that's a nice one. It's a great. I haven't seen that one in a long time. All right. The the faster you held them up, the more cyborg you are. Uh, some of you are more reluctant cyborgs than others. But the idea behind the word cyborg is not that we're Terminator or Robocop. It's that every time you interact with a piece of technology and you add it to yourself temporarily to adapt to a new environment, that makes you a cyborg. The word cyborg came from a 1960 paper on space travel. And the term was an organism to which some extra attachments uh, have, been, have been given so that you can adapt. And that's what humans do. Since the beginning of humanity, we have had tools and evolved outside of ourselves and created these new tools to adapt to these new spaces. A cyborg anthropologist, this is a, a field of study from 1993 that I found when I was in college, uh, looks at the interaction between humans and technology and how technology affects culture. Cultural theorist Douglas Rushkoff would say that we are living in a present shock, not a future shock. We're trying right now to even make sense of our present moment uh, while it tries to catch up with us. And so having even a framework to say, what does it mean when we wake up next to our phones every morning? What does it mean when we go to sleep next to them as well? When they cry and we have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep? When we have to plug them in and feed them? And when we take better care of them than ourselves sometimes, and we interact with them instead of interacting with other people. What does that mean, and where is that taking us? I can't provide all of the answers to the questions here, but I can provide some historical perspective. When I was writing my thesis on mobile phones, right when the iPhone came out, I found this theory of calm technology, which I'll explain to you now. There's this quote that a lot of technologists really like to say, that 50 billion devices will be online by 2020. I don't know if that's a great idea. How many of you have a very good experience with technology? We were told that technology would free our time and allow us to have more moments with each other. But now it seems like technology is a gas that expands to fill every single little moment in our lives. And the question is, how do we get our time back and how do we have a better relationship with our technology? And what does it mean to have a quality life? So if we have this many devices online, I like to ask whenever we have these, this data, does this actually sound good? Does this actually mean something? Uh, so I like to consider different scenarios, like the smart watch that gives you the same notifications on your wrist as on your phone. And you have to, uh, you have to be very careful about which notifications you get sent to you. Or the smart fridge. There are so many United States technology co uh, companies that want me to help build a smart fridge. And I tell them, why do we need a smart fridge? You know, we have dumb cupboards. I store all of my sweets in the dumb cupboard. And they say, well, let's have a thumbprint reader so that you can thumbprint into your fridge. I say, well, when I'm cooking, my hands are dirty. I don't want to put a thumbprint onto a fridge. I have a lock on my door. That's enough. I say, well, maybe there's a, a plan that only you can eat certain items. I said, well, all the items I'll keep in this cupboard. They're not going to be in my fridge, all the bad items. So I keep trying to tell people that we don't need to put things in everything. As the founder of Calm Technology says, we don't need smarter devices. We need smarter people. What are we doing putting intelligence into devices and removing intelligence from ourselves? It doesn't make us feel good. It doesn't allow us to be innovative. When you put everything together, you get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future. Everything speaks a different programming language. Everything has its own support plan. Everything is getting attacked by uh, hackers. Uh, it's taking up more bandwidth than you trying to stream a video online because none of these are written with great code. It's very wasteful. And then finally, everything is giving you a different uh, alert that's not compatible. Imagine having to sell your house and inherit this kitchen from somebody else and try to set up all the new accounts. So 
when you think about, this is a funny scenario, but when people start to rely on this technology, uh, things can go wrong. This is a, a startup that said, you can leave your pet at home, we will automatically feed and water your animal, and you could Skype the animal and see it uh, when you're away. Never worry about feeding your animal again. So the problem is that this relied on an external server. They were so excited to get this product to the market and the promise that it would be functional technology that they forgot to implement offline support. And this means that uh, one day the server went down and the connected pets uh, ended up starving. Um, uh, so this was kind of this new Schrodinger's cat. People didn't know whether their pets were alive or dead. They trusted the technology to feed the pets, and they had to break in and get their pets. Now, this is a situation that is kind of okay if it's an animal, but if it's a human and somebody dies because of it, there's not really a lot of consumer protection or trying to figure out the right way to implement the technology so that if it goes wrong, we're still okay. A lot of the technology that's made today is made in these perfect scenarios in a conference room in San Francisco where you have very good Wi-Fi, very good battery life, the latest technology, and nothing gets hacked. The real world has none of these things. The real world, you have a tiny bit of battery life before you get home, and you have all of the apps on your phone wasting the battery life. You have one bar of energy, or one bar of, uh, of network connection, it's, things are very slow. You have an app that has been hacked because you have a bad password, and then you don't have any attention because everything else is trying to take your attention. So if we work towards building applications and technology that works in bad scenarios, in scenarios that are not optimal, we will have better technology for everybody. It's just hard to convince people right now that that's the kind of technology to build, and that's also the technology that will make the most money because so many more people will be able to use it. I looked at the terms of service of PetNet. It said, PetNet is not responsible for service failures, even though it said you never have to worry about your pet again, and it said you agree that you will not rely on the services for any safety or critical purposes related to you or your pet. Uh, this should be illegal. There should be a warning on connected devices that says, this will probably break, but there's nothing yet. We have an era of interruptive technology. Our own attention is interrupted, battery life, network, security. We need the opposite. We need an era, instead of interruptive technology, a calm technology. What does a calm technology look like? Something where you use the technology and you're not angry at it constantly. The calmest technology is boring. A washer and dryer that you barely notice. A tea kettle that just works and you forget it. Something that's classic, that's been around for a long time that you don't have to worry about repairing. Something that if the lights aren't turned on, you know where the buttons are because it's easy to use. A light switch. Invisible technology like electricity is there when you need it, not when you don't. It works, and when it fails, you notice, but it barely ever, ever fails. When I was writing my thesis, I found these two people at Xerox Park, Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown. Uh, Mark Weiser uh, died and wasn't around to see the era that he predicted, and I feel like it's my responsibility to talk about the era he predicted and try to bring his vision forward. He said that at one point in the future, instead of having many people share one device, one large computer, will have many devices sharing each of us. And at that point in time, the scarce resource won't be attention, or it won't be technology. Technology will be very cheap. The scarce resource will be our attention. And the technology that makes the best use of our attention will be the best technology, because that's the thing we won't have the most of. There's a paper that talks about this, The Coming Age of Calm Technology, and another paper that was very good called the world is not a desktop. In the desktop world, in front of a desktop computer, you had all the attention you wanted. You could sit here, you could do a task for a long time, you never had to worry about battery life, but the world has changed and now we have continuous partial attention. We, don't, we are not able to fully be in a moment because we could get interrupted at any time. So we are continuously shifting our focus around. It becomes dangerous when you're driving a car. 
This is one of the quotes from Mark Weiser. He says, a good tool becomes invisible, and not by invisible that it disappears. You focus on the task and not the tool. A book is a, re a great example of this. A book, when well written enough, you dissolve into. You forget that you're reading a book. You care about the characters in the book more than you do your next door neighbor. And the way that the book is made is that it's calm. All of the complexity is folded into itself, and there's a spine. It's portable. You don't have to charge it. It always stays uh, okay. You can spill coffee on it, and it's cheap to reproduce. You don't have to worry about upgrading your book. So it's a stable technology. So how do we design calm technology? Um, when I was looking at some of this, there were some principles that were set forth to design things that work well alongside us, not cause us to become angry or try to replace us. Uh, we don't have enough resources to replace everybody with robots. And do you really want to automate um, getting married or raising children or, or falling in love or listening to music? I don't think so. Like, there are some things that we should never automate. There, there are, there's not even enough resources to do it. The first principle is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, just some of it and only when necessary. It's very difficult to say this in an era where a lot of our technology is based on advertising and requires our attention. But there are so many other industries out there, like factories um, and uh, all, all, like... Um, like if you're in a, in a supermarket or if you're at a counter trying to order something, it shouldn't take all of your attention to do a task. It should just require your attention when necessary. Uh, a tea kettle is a good example. You set it, you forget it, it tells you when it's done. You don't have to sit there watching it. If a tea kettle were invented today, it would have this crazy panel and you'd press like 10 different buttons. You'd have to Bluetooth it to your phone. It would try to give you a, a, a trend over time about how much you've boiled your tea and then it would sell it to Facebook so you could make some money. <laughs> Technology should empower the periphery. The peripheral, our peripheral attention is, is enormous. Everything right now is so focused on vision. We are all so visual. We forget that we have a sense of touch, we have hearing, and hearing goes all around our head and even far away. Um, how do we use different senses? How do we load the information into different senses so that we can stay attuned to what we're doing and not be distracted? The example of a car is very simple. Everything about a car is supporting your primary focus so that you can calculate where the cars are on the road and make good decisions, well-informed decisions. You don't have to look at the pedal. You press it with your foot. It's using an appendage that you don't usually use. You're using your foot. You have a stick. You have the rear view mirror that you can glance back and forth. And this glanceability using your peripheral attention is key to calm technology. This is a silly example, but this is the Lumo back posture sensor. It just notices whenever you slouch. I see you sitting up for a street. It notices when you slouch and buzzes you. But it's not telling everybody that you're slouching. It's not giving you a notification on your phone. I had an employee that had an insulin pump installed um, because he was diabetic. And he was so excited to get the insulin pump installed. But then I had a meeting with him and he beeped. And he was so upset. I said, can you change the alert? And he said, no. It just beeps. So I've been at a wedding, I've been at a funeral, I've been in a movie theater, and I beep and everybody thinks my phone is on and that I'm being very rude. And then when I'm at a loud concert, it beeps and I can't hear it, which is life-threatening for me. It's an insulin pump. I need to know when to refill the insulin. So he has to set a secondary alarm on his phone that goes off and buzzes so that he can fill his insulin. The whole point of the thing was to be more human and to not be as obviously uh, diabetic. But it failed because a lot of times when we build this new technology, we build it as if it's for a desktop computer. We don't consider that people might have different experiences in different contexts with it. So if you're building something, make sure to allow people to change the notification style to suit their needs. We can't predict what context people will be in. Technology should inform and encalm at the same way. You should be able to get a lot of information in a, in a calm way. Um, this is a simple example of my old house. This is a light bulb connected to a weather report, and all it does is changes color based on what the weather is going to be for the day. That's it. 
If you've seen these videos about these big technology companies that have the disembodied human voice that wakes the person up in the morning, like, hello Dave, today's weather is... Da -da -da. Who wants to wake up to a disembodied computer voice reading the news to you? Nobody wants this. It only works in an advertisement. What people really want is, I walk into my kitchen in the morning, I live in a place that rains most of the time, and this morning it was yellow, and I knew it was going to be sunny, and I jumped up and down with joy, and then I looked at the iPad on the wall to get more information. It's about using a very low resolution indicator, and then allowing somebody to choose whether they want higher resolution information. And it's not using the auditory channel, it's just using feeling, this kind of ambient awareness. Technology should amplify the best of what humans can do and what computers can do. A human, we are very good at curation, understanding context, understanding feeling and emotion, making weird things that people like, composing music, building Stradivarius violins. Try to get a computer to do that. It's going to make it perfect and it won't sound the same way. When you see the, when you see the sound waves, they'll be perfect looking. They won't be these real, beautiful, resonant tones that give us emotion. That's missing when you try to automate things. What is a computer good at? A computer is really good at taking a large data set and finding patterns, taking what was formerly invisible, making it visible, being able to see a trend over time and tell us that there might be a trend there. But it's not good at completely modeling reality. There will always be some pieces missing. What humans and technology are good at is working together. Humans can vote whether a system has done a good job and it will improve the system over time. So if you think about predicting cancer, you can have a tissue sample and you can have a computer read it and say, here's the readout, there's a likelihood of cancer, then the doctor can say, yes, this was this kind of cancer. That goes back into the system and you get a feedback loop. That will outperform any single standalone AI system that's made outside. And it will also outperform any single doctor or group of doctors because it's humans and technology working together, side by side, helping each other, not trying to replace each other. We need technology to live. Technology needs us to live. Every time you try to make a computer that acts like a human, it's incredibly awkward. It also makes us sound like a machine. If you try to use Siri and you don't have the perfect San Francisco accent, you end up saying something to it again and again and again. You end up sounding like a robot. You end up being the one on pause. If you look at Google, you type something into Google, robots behind the scenes are indexing results, and it will show you not one thing, but it will show you a list of items and you make the choice. It's going through millions of pages for you, which is what a computer's good at. But you are making the end choice, and that's the difference. There's only so much a computer can do, and only so much a human can do. And you blend them both together, and you get a harmony. You don't get robots destroying humans and the, the, these nightmare dystopian science fiction worlds. It's very exciting to think about dystopian science fiction worlds, but there are plenty of functional technologies out there right now. They're just really boring. We don't even think that we're interacting with hundreds of thousands of robots when we use Google. But there are hundreds of thousands of robots on the web right now. They just don't look like humans. They're just out there doing an invisible job. This is my friend Todd Huffman's uh, tissue sample scanning robot. What he decided is that it takes a really long time for a human, they'll, they'll, a human will get a degree in biology, and then they will spend years preparing tissue samples and scanning them two-dimensionally. So he said, why are these people who got this PhD stuck in a lab for years doing this incredibly boring task? Why aren't they doing cancer research? Why aren't they coming up with the, experi uh, the experiments to create the new systems, to create the new insights? So he made a robot that you put a three-dimensional tissue sample in. It takes a diamond knife and scans and cuts at the same time, uploads it to a database, and then you have a feedback loop that's able to tell with greater and greater accuracy whether this will become a tumor or not and what kind of tumor it will become with a network of doctors. Now all of these people are freed up because this machine is 1,500 times faster than a human. All of the postdoctoral researchers can now work on real 
work. Actually, they're probably just working on some other boring thing that hasn't been automated yet. Uh, but they are more free to do things that will push us along in medicine faster. This is where automation goes right. It's not the dystopian scenario. It's this very simple feedback loops. We've lost the idea of cybernetics and feedback, but it's really what's working a lot. We might have this idea of AI, but we had AI in the 80s and the 90s and the 60s, and we had AI winters where the extreme excitement of AI wore out because it, it wasn't the perfect thing we expected. You can have perfection in a film. You can have perfection in science fiction. You can have perfection in theory. But the nature is not perfect. We're not perfect. If we embrace our flaws, then we can build really interesting things. Um, in Star Trek, you don't have a spaceship with one kind of human because then they would get attacked and everybody would die. There is a bridge composed of many different types of humans. Humans, non-humans, different creatures, different species. And because of that, every time the ship gets attacked, there's some resiliency. If we don't have that in the future, it's over. We don't have a chance. We can't be a one-size-fits-all culture. We can't be a templated self. Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. Um, this is an example of a, an art project uh, on Mark Weiser's team. It's just a piece of string attached to the web, the local network they had at Xerox Park. And whenever something interesting was happening, the string would whir around, and people would hear it, and they'd come running and see what people were working on. It's like a new version of a water cooler. It was just a cute little thing. Um, but if you think about different indicators, the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner is cute. It's not trying to do everything for a person. It doesn't look like a human. It looks like a trilobite, a prehistoric filter fe uh, feeder. When it's done, it goes dun da da da, and when it's stuck, it goes dun dun. That's it. Everything you need to know is in those two tones. It's not a human voice that says, hello, I'm done cleaning the floor. Can you imagine? Not only would that be dumb, but you would have to translate it into 200 languages or however many markets you wanted to go into, and you'd have to hire a person to speak that or have a really gross voice. You can hear this tone from another room. You know it's dumb. People love R2-D2 and don't like C-3PO as much because R2-D2 speaks in these tones. When we try to engineer these assistive machines and have it have a human voice, we expect to be able to interact with it like a human. A C-3PO might know 200,000 languages, but he's annoying in every single language. <laughs> technology should consider social norms. It's not, that, uh, it's not that technology isn't ready for us. We're usually the ones that are not ready for technology. When the elevator first came out, people were afraid to ride it. They'd never been accelerated that fast in that direction before. The same with the train. It took a bunch of adventurous people to get into that first train and that first elevator to see if they would be smashed. We had to artificially slow down elevators because they were too quick. Because again, we can develop all the technology we want, but there's a kind of metabolism, a digestion rate of humanity for how long it takes us to accept a new thing. So when you make a new product, you have to see where it fits in. And you can't just release 20 features. You have to do one at a time. If you think of the iPhone, it took like 15 years to get from an iPod to the phone we have now. We couldn't have even purchased this crazy giant phone with a network. We had to wait for that long to eat this kind of dinner with an appetizer and a main course and a dessert. It had to be cut up into small pieces for us to accept. Everything that we have right now is a norm. Everybody in the room has a phone with a video camera in it. Fifteen years ago, this would be terrifying. We thought that privacy was dead. We wrote articles about how everyone has cameras now. It's over. We use a camera to take pictures of our food before we eat it as a pre-digestive ritual. This is now, what, what have we done? Um, but it took a couple years, three or four years, for this to become a part of everyday life, to know that you hold up your phone and you take a photo, and that you could duck away if you didn't want to be in the photo. But that norm invisibility line is there. Anything that gets you to that norm, that current norm, is restorative. 
So eyeglasses are considered normal or even decorative. Prosthetic legs are restorative. They take you to that norm. Anything above that norm is enhanced, advanced technology, and that's what causes people fear. That's where Robocop, Terminator, and Google Glass show up. This is why people rejected Google Glass. It was the first time we had something that we could wear here that had too many features. When you have 15 features, people focus on the scariest one, which is video recording. Uh, not to mention that it had 15 minutes of battery life if you video recorded that long. You can't tell somebody that when they react out of fear. You can't, you can't negotiate with somebody who's in a fearful state. And so out of the box, it was very easy to tell that this system would fail. And it's really easy to tell now when people come up with these products that they will fail immediately because they don't even care to research where we are and how comfortable we are with a certain technology. Finally, the right amount of tech is the minimum to solve the problem. Every new feature you add to a piece of technology is something you have to support. I, I like the quote before, to allow something to be a classic, to allow something to be old-fashioned, means that it's stable enough to be that long-lived. Wouldn't it be great if we had a phone as a family heirloom that we passed down every 40 years? That it was that stable? That we didn't have to buy one every year? I mean, it seems impossible now. But this is how the world was. We would have furniture and houses and clothing and homes that we would pass from generation to generation. And now we have something that we have to buy every year or it turns against us and makes our lives slower. I like these technologies because they're boring. The street lights are just a light indicator. It's punctuation for your commute. And this toilet occupied sign on a plane, even if you're red, green, colorblind, this is the sign that never changes on the plane. Everything else changes, Wi-Fi and turbulence and SIPO, everything. But this doesn't change. It's a pictogram. You don't have to translate it. It's just there. It's part of the plane. These boring things are what I look out for. I want to make successfully boring technology that doesn't have to change. That would be amazing. Also, it would be profitable. It doesn't have to not make any money. Everybody would have to have it. And then finally, technology should make use of the near and the far. How many of you, if you turn your phone to airplane mode, can actually use anything on the phone anymore, except for notes and a camera? Remember on a desktop computer, everything that you did on that computer was self-contained. Now it seems ridiculous that we would have a desktop computer. Um, but when we're in situations where we don't have a lot of network access, having everything on your phone is really important because then you have all of your data. So what if when you went to a doctor, all of the data from the doctor was stored with you? And if you wanted new data, you could ask for new data and you could share your information with that server for a limited period of time until you got the diagnosis and then it would be stored to your file. That way, if somebody hacked into the system, they would only have access to just what was shared in that moment and not everybody's files. If we flip these things around, we see our problems right now with security and connectivity are that we expect companies to provide a very crucial function and also be experts in security. <laughs> We can't do this because everything is too exciting for people to hack into. It's all just sitting there. You, you access one part and you get everybody's data, 500 million Yahoo accounts. No big deal. But if we had the opposite way, we would own the data first and then we'd be able to share it. I made this chart and I'm not sure if, if it makes any sense, but the idea is that Early, we had computers far away from us. We had a mainframe at a college that we would go visit, and we would share some time on it. Then the technology was close to us. We had a desktop computer in the home, and all of our stuff was with us. Then we started to have uh, the web and this cloud, and then we started to store everything in the cloud, and now it's really far away, and it's incredibly insecure. So what if we take it back down this curve and store it with us? We have plenty of capability to do that. It just depends on where we are. This could be the next generation of the web and decentralized distributed computing. Just a little bit to think about. Um, then we won't have a lot of these issues we're dealing with and a lot of bandwidth issues too. So if you process as much as possible on the device itself, we have the power to do it. You can improve people's experience. So if good design 
allows you to accomplish your goals in the least amount of moves. You take away until there's nothing left to take away. You take away the moves until people get to their goal. Then Calm Technology does the exact same thing, but with the least amount of mental cost. Because that's the scarce resource, our attention, our time. The Greeks had two concepts of time, chronos or linear time, industrial time, the meeting 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. time, and then kairos time, which is the time outside of time, the time that you lose track, the time of a sunset, the time of falling in love, the time of listening to really good music. When we have these things in our pockets that alert us constantly, we are forced always into chronos time, and we forget that it's in kairos time that we come up with all of these weird ideas and the beauty and the weirdness and the craziness of humans shows up. That's the time we need to conserve. That's the time we need to take back. That's kind of the idea behind the notion of the movement of time well spent. Turn your phone to airplane mode, turn your notifications off, choose when you're interacting with the technology. Don't let it take control of your brain all of the time. Uh, because a, pr a person's primary task shouldn't be computing. Unless you like computing, then definitely compute. But if you just want to do your job, it should be being human. And again, the scarce resource in the 21st century won't be technology. It will be our attention. Um, I wrote a book on this. I've been on this book tour for two years now. I was writing a book on alerts, and I thought this is the most boring thing ever. No one cares. And then everybody started caring about alerts. The next book I'm writing is on sound, because no one cares about sound, but sound is getting really annoying. So maybe when the book comes out, people will care about sound more and how annoying it is to work in an open office where everything is noisy. I also made a website where I took a lot of the original research from Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown and I put it there so you can read the original papers. They're beautiful, they're elegant, they're so easy to read and they hold true in 1994 and 1989 as they do today. They read just like today. It's really amazing to find things that are so clear and so ahead of their time that still are exactly what we have right now. So thank you very much. Good evening and welcome. I'm Malmud Bermejo, manager of this uh, foundation and uh, cultural space of Telefonica for us. It was a great challenge to uh, introduce changes in Telos. 35 years of a magazine and give you, well, they give you, they, they're really scary because um, we have had very relevant people in the magazine, in the newsroom in terms of technologic, uh, technology progress, future of all uh, last decades in this country. We've been thankful to everyone that have made possible that tell us this, this uh, prestigious magazine that is still this prestigious magazine um, in the world, uh, in the scientific and uh, technological world, in the world rankings, and we would like to preserve this enormous 
characteristic, uh, this uh, huge characteristic and this role that uh, we had um, played during all this time and we wanted to combine it with a more transgressive or younger uh, point or a perspective we want to increase the range of contents we wanted it to have a much more um, divulgation touch without losing that academy touch uh, that has always been a characteristic of TELUS we wanted to increase, we wanted to expand it, we wanted to uh, move it to a younger audience preserving that audience that has always been a characteristic and we're really proud of it of course we have lived it and we've enjoyed it for so many years so many decades for this we wanted to have to um manage this uh, committee with one of the persons that was born with a talus under the arm his uh, teacher at the university carlos tercero in madrid in communication and he managed the Avanza plan for between 2004 and 2008, he communicated it correspondingly, he's an expert in communication, he has been advisor in some governments in terms of technology during our uh, democracy and I won't make further presentations, I, uh, we had to explain, in, we, had, we had to have Juan Zafra as the manager of the uh, newsroom committee. As you can see, he has plenty of friends, he's going to sit down, and after that we will call Amber Case again, but Juan, I would like to say thank you to our marvelous uh, research committee and scientific committee. He, it is the one that supervises the transparency and the accuracy of the contents that appear in this magazine. This supervision, thanks to their wisdom, I'm really thankful. Um, I don't want to, to say all their names because I'm sure that I would forget some names, but thank you very much to all of you. A big round of applause, please. They are sat down here in the first row. And I'm going to sit down and I'll Im invite Amber Case again to join us and to, to have a, a, a chat. Amber, please. What a great masterclass you've given. Uh, I'm a cyborg. I think that after what you've said, I'm cons I consider myself a cyborg. Do you think that I should be concerned? I, I think it's just who you are. <laughs> I think you just have to be concerned with whether you're happy or not, and whether you feel like you're spending your time well with technology and it's working with you or it's working against you. And then you can be concerned, and it is your own choice. Yo creo que vivimos con la tecnología, vivimos para la tecnología. Nosotros, como sabes. I think that we live with technology, we are a technological company, as you know. Uh, well, I shouldn't say this before this audience, but I'm, I'm going to, to, to show off, of course. We are a big telco company with 75 years of history. And with an extraordinary uh, future, if it's possible. But I would like to ask you, understand, uh, well, good technology, bad technology. This morning we had a chat with journalists about something that was really shocking to me. Now we are holding a discussion about ethics and moral of artificial intelligence. You were saying that in some way we have tried that robots or AI, artificial intelligence, were similar physically to human beings. The are, are we against this ethical uh, discussion because of this, in terms of who's going to be the owner? How are going to be the laws that control these cybers, if they are going to control us in the future? This, this kind of visual keeps coming up that there are these robots that look like humans and AI that we can't tell is a human or not. But we can't even make a robot that looks like a human with a, I mean, it's very obvious. It's not even necessary, uh, unless it's a sex robot and then it's necessary. But it's not, um, th these arguments are very sci-fi. What really happens in places like the Industrial Revolution is people die and then regulations happen. Um, canned meat is not canned well, 
or the Titanic sinks, and then we get regulation and, and standards for um, for our ships and for radio. So what it would be nice is if we have private companies that have AI algorithms, and they say what variables they use, so that we know what biases are there. Because if we have an algorithm that's recommending something to us, but it doesn't have a complete data set, and it's not diverse enough, it will just continue the bias of the person that programmed it. So we have to be very careful about making these black boxes that we think are morally better than us when they're made by humans. And they're made by a very small set of humans that isn't necessarily understanding all of the context. You know, they're, they're usually you know, younger people who might just be out of college who think it's great but don't understand some of the repercussions. And so either we'll have the repercussions and we'll get the regulation then, or we'll say we need to make sure that these systems are fair and ask the question, what are we optimizing for? Do we really need the AI? I mean, I would argue the thing that we need the most is um, better bandwidth so we can f call people on the phone with our face and so we don't lose all of the, uh, the nonverbal communication. Um, it's the same kind of thing that we worried about in the Industrial Revolution. It's just another version of the Industrial Revolution. It's going to have similar actions and similar repercussions, but if we follow history, we might be able to um, preemptively um, care about these things before they get too bad, like the, the pet feeder example. And we don't want to have that happen to a person in a hospital, for instance. So if we can say, test your software in this way under these conditions first, we can prevent that kind of future from happening. It's just hard to tell companies to do that right now. Juan, eh, cuéntanos qué novedades hay en, en el humano digital. Juan tells about the new things in the digital human that are the contents that are included in this n n uh, new issue of Telos. And the, you that have interviewed Amber, what have you discovered after being with her and after knowing her way of thinking? Well, Jose Maria was saying that Amber transmits, uh, conveys peace with her cyborg um, aspect, a little bit less than mine because, well, I'm wearing glasses and I was having a mic. I, I was more cyborg than you. I have my watch that is connected with my, I with my iPhone, the iPod, etc. Well, I think that it is what what we are saying in this issue in, of TELUS is a new horizon and it uh, sets new questions and other ones that we want to we want to pose and then you can tell us where are we where are we going to where do you want to go and how do we want to be there and amber reflects during her speeches about these type of things um like questions like ethics how we face or how we manage machines how we uh, relate with machines and how we talk among each other this is something that we have uh, spoken about during the interview and we have been speaking about this for all day long during uh, many interviews that I've had today well basically that's the point but the new digital human well the new stage of TELUS and I well I've missed all the acknowledgements please uh, let me do this hyperlink thanks to uh, Jose Maria Sanpagellon thanks to all the team that um, makes uh, Fundación Telefónica for the trust and the responsibility thank you so much let's see if we can catch up and after this hyperlink I continue with new TELUS new TELUS is the uh, thanks to the scientific committee by the way new Talus is open to the singularity era to this singularity era that would be defined as the era of a scientific progress and technological progress converging conflu confluing and making it progress exponentially up to now changes were linear so to speak no matter how surprised that was, so surprising that was, now they are exponential because the processing capability has multiplied and thanks to the fact that different structures give us a possibility of communicating, communicating this progress and 
in science and technology very fast. Well, what, what Haber is uh, proposing is, is this, but let's think about where are we leading to. This is the era of singularity. And one of the particular things of this era, some of the members, and not all the members of the scientific committee know what this means, this era opens a new human defined as a transhumanism even there are people that go beyond post-humanism that's the definition of a new human being this is the one that we are trying to describe in the um, in the magazine that is the some, some kind of of the center of the magazine we have kept a similar structure than the one that we have uh, followed up to now and again, another hyperlink, uh, another acknowledgement for all the people that have made TELUS possible after now, uh, up to now. And I was born with a TELUS under my arm. That's true. <laughs> we, wanted, we didn't want to be disruptive because we thought this, that disruption... Well, and we discussed about the main topic of the new issue. Uh, disruption has taken us to uh, dystopia scenario, to uh, fears, to be scared, and we were, for, for the next issue, I invite you to participate, of course, to speak about utopias. Dystopia is a unpleasant and non-desirable future, and utopia is a better and desirable future. And technology can make a better and desirable future in many aspects. In so many aspects that it is what we want to uh, to tackle in the new tellers, uh, from the infrastructures and uh, computational intelligence, quantum computation, to um, biological progress, uh, uh, spatial progress, as we uh, f tackle in this issue, because in transhumanism we also think about conquering new planets for all the human beings. And here, here we have David Barrado, he's one of the researchers uh, in that uh, sense, and he has written in this Talos issue, but I wouldn't like to, to speak uh, for so long, because you have to have a look at it. Talos opens a new era based on participation, being open to new contents, contents that are confluent. I, I, like, I prefer to say that they uh, come together rather to, than saying that uh, they are convergent. So the website will be continuously updated, keeping that accuracy that you've mentioned before. And it's a great challenge to do it more digital with everything that that involves, making more participative, more agile, more multi-platform, and more collabor collaborative. That's true. Well. Another question after reading the great interview to Amber Case, uh, the transition, if there has been a transition, but I guess that there has been a transition between the Homo sapiens and Homo, homo connected. What have we lost from the Homo sapiens to become a Homo connected? Well, humans are weird because they started to stand upright and they started to have live birth that wasn't completely finished yet. You see a giraffe have a baby giraffe and the giraffe can run around very quickly. But humans uh, started to have these premature, weird, squishy things and we had to take care of them and that, that meant that we had all these extra tools so that we could be okay with reality around us. Um, and what's happened with our communication is that we've had the, the the papyrus and the and you know cave paintings, all these different ways of storing data outside of ourself, and now it's super fast. So this this Homo connectus is just what do we get out of this connection? We get more of a a kind of collective identity. We get a kind of a Borg. We get micro singularities. We've already seen the singularity before. It was the shot heard round the world. That was an early singularity, I would say, a slow one. Um, uh, Michael Jackson's death uh, was definitely micro singularity. Um, you know, earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, these these news events. Now we have faster, 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 faster micro singularities. If that's what the singularity is like, I don't want the singularity. Like, I I want to. If you if you look at you know the future will not be built by technology. The future will be built by humans because we're the ones that build things. Now, 
there will be incentives for certain types of technologies to take over. But we have to remember that utopia or dystopia, utopia is a, an ironic word that means no place. You know, I would say we have a mild dystopia right now. We can fly all over the world, but we have to wait in line to do it. Um, we have to sit in the tiny seat. We have to have bad kind of JPEG compressed food that doesn't taste very good. And so we have to think, what, what can we do alongside technology to blend it with the things that have worked with us for the last 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 years on biodynamic planting, um, ensuring that there's more of a species. If we want to eat salmon, we need to ensure that there's more salmon so the market increases. So how do we work uh, with an ecological cybernetic feedback model so that we can improve everything versus compressing people down into these tiny miserable spaces where they're put on hold. I don't think that's a future we want. There's a silly phrase called fully automated luxury communism <laughs> where everybody's in their little tiny uh, condominium and they press a button and they get the food. What is that? That is not a future that I think anybody wants. I think a future is somewhere where you don't need a car, there's, a lo there's local plants and crops, you celebrate that strawberries are in season, you know your neighbors, and you can let your kid run down the street for as far as the kid wants because you know that everybody in the neighborhood knows them. When you look at people who are super technological, when they take a break, they go to nature. They go to a place where there's humans. I don't want to see a society where we have so few people having children because there's no money to do it that we have to have a kind of Japanese style automation system. That's why Japan is so obsessed with automation. They, they have to do it. And so I think there's a lot of restructuring that we can do that's also profitable to do. There's models where um, we can do this and actually makes more of a market than less of a market. Um, it's hard right now because we're in an era where we have publicly traded companies that are required to expand uh, and they're treated like humans. Uh, we need a human bill of rights before we have a robot bill of rights. We need to once again look at the industrial era where we had 10 hour day limits and say let's have a 10 hour day limit for email or a 5 hour day. Let's look at when you have something that's so instant you don't respect it. So we have instant communication but it doesn't mean we have more meaning. It means that we have less meaning distributed on many text messages. So if we have less time and space with this technology, we have more of a balance, we might use it a little bit better. Which is why I like, you know, FaceTime is really nice because you see a person and you feel like you're a little bit there. That's, that's nice. Um, but there's a lot of these issues that we have to really deal with. Um, and I'm concerned as long as we keep going in this direction, if, if, if large companies keep trying to do these very short-term things, we'll just have these bad user experiences that we have to deal with. And eventually, if we automate too much, too early, we'll forget why we automated in the first place. We're having this with factories. The original generation that we automated, um, they knew how to fix the machines. The next generation that comes in, doesn't know why the thing is broken and how to fix it. So how do we have a balance between automating some things also in a way that they can be serviced um, and at the same time getting that information that was formerly invisible and making it visible? These are all kind of narratives that aren't really talked about right now and I want to bring them up because there are narratives from the 60s and the 80s and the 90s and the 1920s and the, the Macy meetings from the 1940s with cyberneticists and anthropologists coming together saying, once these things fit in our pockets, what does that mean? Can we, pre, can we preview what this world will be like? And now we're finally in that world and I'm afraid that most of us don't have enough reflective time because we don't have a good relationship with our technology that we can't consider these questions and work on solutions. And I personally love technology. We need it. It's not that we shouldn't have a lot of it. But our relationship with it is a little bit bad right now. It's a little bit abusive, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so if we try to hybrid it and we blend the new and the old, I think we can have a pretty harmonious, unique, and interesting society that also has functional 
business models. Now I'm just like getting really excited and I don't know if any of this makes sense or means anything, but this is what keeps me up at night. Um, going towards a situation like this, which I think is a world people would probably want to live in a little bit more than the world right now. Contestando a la evolución de, del Homo sapiens. Answering to the Homo sapiens uh, evolution, well, just very briefly, you said that what have we lost? I think that we don't lose, it's just an evolution, and as far as we are evolving, we are not seeing what are the advantages of that evolution. We are enjoying them, and we are afraid when we think uh, how this evolution is going to progress and as changes are being really fast and dramatic this generates some kind of instability and the usual react reaction is fear and we don't have to when the homo connected beings uh, come along they look at us that are in progress of uh, accomplishing that maximum connection and they would they would say well how afraid they were nobody will understand it and about this uh, scenario, well, the decisions are made by human beings. Big data, uh, machine learning, AI. But the final decision are, are made, or is made by, by human beings, unless we give up on that. There's an, in an interesting article that is titled uh, Thinking Machines versus my learning machines are um, against humans and they s they say well is it possible that human beings are able to be controlled by learning machines that, le that learn by themselves and through algorithms they are able to guide human kind uh, or the human beings life well I think I don't think that's the case uh, there's an article by Ivan Mejia I would say that he's a cyber activist in Mexico that uh, will uh, present the magazine in Mexico in, a, in some, some days time and he speaks about how this human digital human being is defined this human being that is connected and who has a different uh, way of thinking compared to the one that we used to have and this different mindset would say that is defined by transparency and generosity when sharing knowledge to generate a collective intelligence and this only can be better for everyone and a uh, and this is what the website that tells website want um, to have plenty of collaboration so that we can generate a collective intelligence so I'm thinking about another question maybe the last one because I consider that it is time to to wrap up and we have to listen to Carlos López Blanco. I'll give the floor right now. But just the last question. How do you educate since you are a child, since the m smallest uh, child, how do you educate a digital human? How do you educate a digital human? <laughs> In schools, how do you have to introduce technology in schools to train digital humans? Um, hmm. I would suggest that kids play outside for as long as possible <laughs> and learn their bodies and their minds, climb trees, and then when they're given a piece of technology, it's not so that they can take pictures of them and their friends in a cool thing that they wore to get Instagram points. It's to do something. I was first introduced to an Atari computer. Um, my dad bought an Atari when I was born. He was afraid he could never buy another computer, so I grew up with a computer. But the computer was my friend because it helped me to write. It helped me to have better penmanship that helped me there were you know I played some games on it but I had to learn DOS to play the game so I had to learn a little bit of programming and things there was um, it was tough to get into the computer so right now we think oh my kid is smart and knows how to use an iPad no the iPad is good at humans now it doesn't mean your kid is smart your kid is just learning a two-dimensional screen and they're not developing the corneal depth in their eyes that they need
to perceive outside of a dimly lit room, you know? We have to have a variety of things. My concern is that people don't have enough time to spend with their kids learning how to cook or redo a car or something like that. We need more tactile stuff. If you do introduce it into a school, I think physical books are really good and writing is incredibly important because the act of writing in space and that document that you can flip through that's physical activates a different part of your brain than just typing on a computer. The same with a book, turning open the page, taking notes, highlighting. It's that spatial memory that we don't have when everything is compressed in two dimensions. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have textbooks on, on, on things like that as reference guides. There's a whole different thing behind that, but I think as an introduction, you know, it should be you know, learning how to do some digital photo manipulation or something creative or making music, something fun, um, and not training people to be a miniature media person just yet. They can do it later. Um, but initially it should be a tool, just like a hammer and a nail. Um, because then I think there'll be a chance that people won't just get sucked in to something that's causing an uptick in depression and, and anxiety. So that you have more meaning outside and then you use a computer as a tool to connect with other people who have similar meaning to you so that you can meet in real life. <laughs> uh, like we're all meeting here. We use the technology to find out that this event happened and then we're all here, right? And so the point, when the telephone came out, people were afraid people would sit in a room and never talk to a human again. It was a way to make and schedule appointments or, or talk to people when they missed each other. So I think we, you know, just be careful and don't let... It's really hard if you're a parent because you don't have any time. <laughs> but uh, I see parents just giving their toddler a flat screen and the kid doesn't learn to work for something. There's a joy and a frustration in trying really hard and finally accomplishing a thing. If somebody's used to getting everything at the click of a button, how are they going to be an adult when it takes five, ten, infinity years to buy a home or to do these goals? The long-term goal setting is really, really important, and you don't get that when everything is instantaneous. Um, the, the iPad was created actually in 1968 as a prototype by Alan Kay at Xerox Park. As an education tool, there's all these papers on exactly how it could be used for education. It had a physical tactile keyboard and a screen this large. Um, I don't think the iPad really is that anymore. It's an entertainment <laughs> device. So I would just be really, really careful. Give somebody um, drawing lessons, give them ceramics lessons, and let them be a kid, and let them be really dumb, and let them be silly because a lot of parents are forcing their kids to be these perfect things and the kids, you sh the people should be allowed to be mediocre should be totally okay Pues ya como estoy haciendo el repaso de los autores de la revista muy brevemente hay un artículo Well, there's an article in the section of analysis that's the one that is open to new fields about the new uh, setup of uh, the hierarchy hierarchical model and what it and it conveys the need of uh, promoting entrepreneurship and deleting the uh, purely hierarchical concepts that I recommend and there's another article by Antonio Rodriguez de las Heras who I'm going to quote uh, he usually highlights during his uh, workshops that we are in revolution, in te technology revolution times, I would say that we are in a techno-scientific revolution and what is necessary to adapt our lives is a cultural revolution. And this cultural revolution can only be built from education and we have to review all the pr pr educational procedures from basic education to university education all the uh, contents all the programs all the way how uh, the the lessons are taught these two quotes and after that how do we tackle to get into into conceptual uh, issues uh, during these two minutes left so I think that uh, we have to face it with generosity, with respect, and thinking of everything that we have in, in pro 
common, he said, because it has to do with the collective knowledge. Bauman wrote a book that was called Retrotropia that warns about the risk of seeing any ancient times better, and even present, better than the future. And that is an important risk, but the only thing that is true in my life is that any ancient times was previous, and that's it. And on top of that, we have to create excitement, excitement for a future that among us all it's obviously better. If we want it to be better, of course. Okay then, so thank you very much, Amber Case. Thank you very much, Juan Zafra. We are really excited with this uh, renewal of our TELUS and we are really excited with uh, the wrap-up of this uh, great event. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, our great friend and manage, uh, general manager of Telefonica, Carlos Lopez Blanco, thank you very much. Amber, this is the interpreter. Thank you for being so inspiring. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Uh, Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Telefonica, well, to Telefonica Foundation. This is a newer statement. So we are here to open a new era of TELUS. And we, if we forget about the Aristoteles expression, we should wonder if the ones that uh, decided about the name of the magazine were right or not because after 107 issues and having been able of avoiding since 1985 this very special uh, magazine during 32 years this has been much more than just a purpose tell us it's been a reference magazine in a world and then was much more visionary in a perspective that was much more visionary but now we've seen it uh, in upper cases reflection and we see in the concerns that we have in Telefonica it has become into one of the main discussions and perspectives of, te of technology and technological evolution this perspective that was opened by TELUS with this was uh, was quite new at its time to understand technology from social sciences from culture and from communication at its time was probably a near perspective but now is a need in discussion and in the moment where we are in the digitalization process. I want to insist once again on the gratitude of uh, Fundación Telefónica to all the people that have made uh, possible this uh, really fruitful and long history of TELUS, especially Abdulio Martin, who is uh, with us, Enrique Bustamante. I would like to mention our gratitude to Javier Nadal and Emilio Gil Olmo that as a uh, vice president of uh, Fundación Telefónica um, bet on it really uh, w w with a great effort. We have had three stages uh, in this magazine until 1997, until 2002 and 2008 and today we open a fourth stage but we're not opening a uh, we're not starting from scratch. We are just revamping the magazine. But why opening a new stage uh, as a magazine like TELUS? Because the world is changing. The world is changing and changing dramatically. As uh, our president likes to say, it's not that we are in a, in a change changing era, we are living a change of, a, of an era. We are facing a radical change uh, moment. It's an invasion of traditional world, not only in the economy because of digitalization, and this affects everything and everyone. There won't be any field of human activity that it is free from this process with the implications that it has from all points of view because this affects and up to now it has been the perspective that we have fused it affects the economy it affects companies but it goes beyond it's starting to affect the rules of the game in economy in regulation etc but apart from that 
it's a setting, and we've seen that during the uh, Amber's, Amber Case's speech and with some things that have been said, it's a setting and establishing new dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, as everything that has to do with the use of inter the Internet of Things or as a new ethics of the data use that we defend. Because we don't we just don't accept that that idea that data are the new oil. They are much more than that because they involve people, their privacy and their rights. And this is also changing and this is why we think that TELUS today makes more sense than ever. This is changing politics uh, pol and the institutions. It, we need a reflection about how democracy has to be in the digital world. And it's a little bit scary to talk about these uh, reflections that say that there has to be a digital democracy. I think that we should rather see how to preserve the rules of democracy, the rule of law in a digital world, or to build that important phenomenon for fr the uh, free societies as public opinion. And today it is really it's really at risk among all fake news, social networks, etc. So we are speaking about new challenges and radical challenges that are being, being very important for Telefonica with an attempt that we defend and it is that we have to humanize digitalization. We have to understand the consequences of this uh, digitalization process and to understand them and to make a digitalization for the people, a digitalization that takes values into account and with all uh, to all these problems deep and radical problems we want to give some answers from this new stage in Talos, uh, trying to connect with new audiences that maybe after 32 years uh, it was necessary to do it with a new design that is that tries to reflect this new era and with a new website that will play an essential role in the, ne in the new TELUS. An amber case is a symbol and we are really thankful that she's here. Uh, she embodies that new uh, approach that we want to give to TELUS. Although she has drawn a great retropia with her uh, drawing of the future because and this recalls me my, my young years when I played on the, on the street there were no cars I knew all uh, my neighbors and I only ate strawberries during the summer and last but not least I would like to thank the team that has been in charge of this process especially Almudena always with her enthousi enthusiasm and her uh, vision. Thanks to Jose Manuel Zafra, who is a, a journalist on the dark side. I always thought that this uh, journey through the dark side wouldn't, wouldn't last so long. Rosa Saez Elvira and Pablo Gonzalez, good luck to all of you during this new era because we are sure that it will be a great success and it will be a success because today tell us more than ever is a necessary product thank you very much so wrap up thank you very much for coming and welcome and well you know that you can buy the book at different bookstores and you can download it for free okay thank you very much